Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we ask you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. We ask you for the unveiling of your heart. Even now, Lord, come and touch us. Those that you have sent forth like arrows to the marketplace to bring the kingdom of God to affect society and to manifest the glory of your Son. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight I want to talk on historic premillennialism. Now, that seems like a strange title to some of you. To others, you know exactly what that means. But this is, I'll say this, as we're talking to those in the uh, call to the marketplace tonight, that this is a very significant subject for the people that are called to the realm of the marketplace or government or military or education, that that's your primary assignment in the kingdom of God. Now, when the Lord arose from the dead, he came back and appeared to his disciples and he gave the glorious great commission. We know it well when he commanded the church to disciple the nations. Now, that discipling of the nations is increasing as we get closer to the glory of the second coming of Christ. The, the, the anointing to disciple the nations is actually increasing. And the call to disciple the nations means to impact every sphere of society with the kingdom of God. Not just to lead them to salvation, but you to go forth as an ambassador to that station in society to release the ways of the kingdom not just, to, again, to minister to people how to get saved, but to actually establish the presence and the power and the ways of God into that sphere of responsibility that the Lord has given you. Now, this great commission, as it's called, is actually a promise of a great anointing. And that anointing increases as we get closer and closer to the Lord's return. Now, the issue at hand that's so significant is what is the context that we should expect as we get closer to the Lord's return? Meaning, what should we expect? Is it going to get easier? Is the glory going to increase? Is the pressure going to increase? What are we expecting as God is calling different ones to their assignment in the society, in the community, whether in the marketplace or the government or education or media. And there's a lot of confusion in the body of Christ on this subject. One camp says it's going to get really bad, and another camp says it's going to get really good, and the Bible says it's going to get really bad and really good at the same time. And we don't need to pick one extreme or the other. And many believers, they pick one extreme or the other. One camp, it's going to get really bad, so why even try? Another camp, they exaggerate it. It's going to get so good, I mean, it's going to be almost nothing but victory everywhere. And then the third camp, which is the most popular, they say, you know, I don't get any of it. I'm not even going to bother with trying to figure it out. I'm just going to let things take care of themselves when we get there. That's actually the worst position. Because the Bible gives so much information clearly written in the Word as to what we are supposed to expect in terms of the negative and what we are to expect in terms of the positive and the tension of those two realities. Now, if we have an accurate biblical picture, an accurate biblical picture, then as the negative and the positive unfold, our faith is strengthened. And we have resolve and clarity to keep pressing on. But if we have a wrong biblical picture, we end up in confusion. We end up in offense because it becomes more difficult than we thought. Or we end up in fear. Or we end up in just so much ambiguity and confusion. We say, we don't even want to do this because nobody even has any clarity as to what's happening. Now the Bible's given us, paragraph A, a very clear perspective on the end times. And we want to have an accurate biblical perspective so that 
We stay steady with confidence, but we're girded to endure while we overcome. One guy says, do we overcome or do we endure? There is endurance while overcoming. So there's the anointing of power to overcome individually, as well as our impact on the nations. But there's the necessity and the anointing to endure because the tides of darkness and evil will get stronger and stronger, yet the glory will increase more and more. And both the positive and the negative will continue to increase as we draw near to the time of the Lord's return. What we believe, I have here in paragraph 8, what we believe about the end times greatly affects how we approach the work that we do for the kingdom. And it's not enough to just do human logic. Like I've heard people say with a really, with a, an overly optimistic view, you know what? I just want to be positive. It's not an issue of just wanting to be positive. What we want is to be accurate. We want to agree with truth. We don't get to vote on the plan that God has already established. We only get to agree with it, to understand it and agree with it. So I've, over the years, I've heard guys more in the positive end talk about how, you know, it's such a bummer to think about the negative, so let's ignore it. And I said, no, no, we really can't do that because we're not the Lord of the process. There's one far smarter with far greater power than us who is determining the great master plan. And what we want to do is understand it and come into agreement with it so that we have the anointing to overcome individually as well as our impact on the nations, while at the same time having the anointing to endure faithfully to the end without any wavering whatsoever in the midst of great resistance. Ideas have consequences. If we have wrong ideas, either too positive or too negative, or the third view, just too vague, just we don't think about it, those three Wrong positions have serious consequences in our thinking, in our attitude, in our actions. We can't take the ostrich approach, put our head in the ground, and just hope that what's in front of us and what's coming won't come. That's not a responsible way to bring, to go forth in the kingdom. But rather, one guy said, I'm not a muddy eyed pessimist. I'm not a starry-eyed optimist. I'm a wide-eyed realist. And I think that's the way that we want to approach this. Paragraph B. Before I give you what I believe to be a clear biblical presentation of, I mean, a clear presentation of what the Bible says about the major trends of the end times. Now, there's a lot, there's a lot of room for opinions and errors on the fine details. But the broad strokes of the positive and the broad strokes of the negative, I find are quite straightforward in the Bible if you take the Bible at face value, meaning you interpret it in a literal way. It means what it says and says what it means. If you take that approach, which is the approach we take here at IHOP, then the main positive trends and the main negative ones are really straightforward, and it's not so confusing. Now, if we go beyond the positive, I mean, the big trends to the, you know, the more specific details of timing. Now, those things, there's a lot of room for opinions and, and to not get it just right. But the broad strokes, I believe that we can have clarity on it and to be, and to have confidence about that, that we've understood the word of God. Paragraph B. Even before I share my ideas, but they're not my personal ideas. They're, I mean, they are personal and they're mine, but they also are shared by our team because they're personal and they belong to the other members of our team as well. I'm going to give you what we believe is a appropriate, accurate, biblical view of the positive and the negative so we can have a steady anointing to overcome and to endure in a steady way without drawing back in fear, confusion, or just giving up and giving in. But before I give you some of these ideas, and again, 
We won't cover all the notes. We got an extensive amount of notes here, six pages. I'm going to give you just kind of a a little brief overview as we go through some of the pages here, and we'll skip uh, some entire pages. But I want to say this, paragraph B. Don't accept, don't, we don't ask anyone to just accept our views. When our Bible school students come, one of the things we tell them, we want to teach them to think for themselves. And I urge them, no matter if, it, if it, I'm the one teaching them or one of the other Bible school teachers, don't accept anything that you don't see with your eyes in your own Bible. And that they actually have a responsibility to challenge something if they can't see it in the Word of God. Now they need to challenge it with a humble spirit, and they're in the right way, in the right spirit, but they need to challenge it. Our definition of loyalty is not just agree with us. Our definition of loyalty is we have a responsibility together in the community that we're here together to challenge one another that we are walking in the truth together. Just do it with humility, the right spirit in the right way. Paragraph C, this is very important, that we have some views that are really different from some others around the nation and the nations, but we honor the godliness And we honor the wisdom of many men and women of God that hold different views. And what I mean by we honor their godliness and wisdom, we honor their walk in the Lord. And we honor their ministries. They have tremendous revelation of the Lord. Though we disagree with this issue, we honor who they are, and we honor the the, uh, significant amount of things the Lord has done through them. I have many names that I could think of that I have this feeling for, Some I know well and some I don't know except for by their writings. And I have tremendous honor because as we approach the coming of the Lord, as we draw nearer to it, and nobody knows the day, the hour when he's coming, but we need to grow in honor and love and unity while we're trying to become more uh, clear and accurate as to what the Bible says about this subject. Paragraph D, the point that is most controversial that we hold here at IHOP is that the church is raptured after going through the tribulation period, but going through the tribulation in great victory and great power. Now this differs from the pre-tribulation rapture view. Now most of you are aware of that. That says the church will be raptured any time, and then after the church is taken up, then the tribulation comes. I believe that that is not the uh, teaching of the Scripture. I, again, I honor the people that teach that. I don't honor that particular thing. I think the air is a very significant air because it leaves people unprepared for the most glorious hour of human history. Because the Great Tribulation is not just the most difficult hour for the nations, it's the most glorious hour for the church. It's the hour where we will walk in the greatest victory and anointing of any time in church history. Paragraph E. Now, there's several popular end-time views that are being taught today. Again, I mentioned already, but I'll just say them again. One view, it's too pessimistic. And that would be the dispensational premillennial view. That says the rapture's coming, and why bother impacting society? The Antichrist is going to take it over anyway. The devil's going to win for a season anyway. Let's kind of draw back. Let's lead people to Jesus and just hang in there until then. That's a, in my opinion, that's too pessimistic of a view of the end times. But there's the other view that's too optimistic. That the glory is going to be so great. And the darkness, it will be there, but it will be so minimized by the power of the church that we will Christianize all of society. It may take a few hundred years, but it's going to get better and better and stronger and bigger, and the darkness will just kind of recede, and eventually all the nations will be Christianized, and then Jesus will come in full delight because of the great job that we did, and we'll hand the nations to him. Now, there's actually quite a few people who believe that. That's too uh, optimistic. That's called post-millennialism. And I believe that that view will lead people in the decades to come to great confusion and disillusionment. It's it's a bit popular now because the message is we're called to the marketplace. 
guess what? We're going to get more money that's going to get easier, and we're going to get more favor. I mean, now, who doesn't like that message? More money, easier, more favor, cool. I think I'll vote for that message. We don't really get to vote. There is already a plan that's made clear from heaven. Yes, it is true. We will walk in greater anointing, but there will be greater resistance. The victory will be greater, but the fight will be greater too. There will be great advances of the kingdom, but there will be setbacks as well. And we need to be girded for both, uh, both because if we're only imagining that it's going to get better and better, we are going to be, people will be greatly disappointed. And at the end of the day, they will be offended at Jesus and they will not trust his leadership. Though it's a little bit popular to say, Glory, you're going to get more favor, money, honor, and easier. And you'll get a clap and an applause for a season until the trouble comes. And then the confusion begins there. Now, having said that, there are promises in the Bible that are made for their fullness in the millennial kingdom when Jesus returns. That they will have their full manifestation after he returns. He sits on his throne in Jerusalem. However, those promises that are released in fullness at the time of his coming, they, we don't wait until he comes, until they fu- are fully manifest, before we begin to experience those promises. They are released in part even now before he comes. The key word is they're released in part. It's not an issue of either we wait for the full promises when he comes and just live in nothing, or we have the full promises before he comes. No, it's in between. There's a fullness that will happen only when he appears, but whatever happens in fullness in that hour will happen in part and even an increasing measure as we approach that hour. Because whatever Jesus does when he comes, it's what's in his heart now. It's his nature. It's part of his plan. And if it's in his heart, and he's already planned it, and it's in his wisdom, then dimensions of it, measures of it, we can expect to be released even now. So it isn't an issue of total barrenness now, and then full glory when he comes, but it's quite different. When we know the nature of what he wants to do when he comes, we know that's what he will do in part even now. So we still believe him for those dimensions of his power to be released in an increasing way as we approach his appearance. Paragraph F. Our view here at IHOP KC is it's uh, it's called historic premillennialism. That's a very uh, popular view for 2,000 years. Multitudes of teachers in the body of Christ have held that. It's a historic, traditional view. It's historic, premillennial. Post-tribulation, thats that would be the term. However, traditionally, I believe that that position comes up short. Though I believe it's the most accurate tradition through church history that represents the, what the Bible says, there is, and most people who hold that view, they don't hold the view of the victorious praying church in context to it. So I tell people, they say, what's your end time view? I say, I tell them historic premillennialism, but with a victorious church. Now, some of you say, I don't know all those words. I want to assure you of this. There's only about five or ten words. You can learn them in five minutes, and you really need to know them. The reason you need to know them, because these terms are being used by leaders all over the body of Christ, all over the world right now, in increasing uh, in an increased way, meaning people were not talking about them so much some years ago, but right now, because the Spirit is emphasizing the mandate and the anointing to disciple nations, which means to bring the influence of the kingdom out into society, because of that Holy Spirit emphasis, the question is, how far can we go? How good will it get? How bad will it get? And there's all kinds of different uh, uh, well, there's only several main positions, but people are being entrenched in those positions, and there's there's uh, real resistance. Some 
camps against the other in, in, in the position that they hold. And you want to know what the Bible says. And you want to be able to give an accurate, concise, biblical answer when you're challenged. When someone says, what do you mean it's going to get better? What do you mean it's going to get worse? You want to be able to have the basic, simple Bible answers to that. So if you're one of those that has said, you know, it's, it's just so who knows anyway, don't have that posture. Because in the next 10 years, the next 20 years, these ideas, I mean, which posture you take, And what Bible verses you use to back it up will be a huge issue in the body of Christ. And it's growing now in its importance and and its emphasis in the body of Christ. So just decide you're going to break down and learn a few of these terms. And really, there's only five minutes worth of terms, about five or ten of them. And you get them, and I am, in this handout here, giving just a real brief synopsis of them. And if you get these clear, you will be able to discover what the Bible says about the positive and the negative in a general sense. Now, we don't have all the details. And you will be able to answer those who oppose you or resist your position. And you really want to be able to do that. Okay, let's look at paragraph G. The harvest of righteousness... And the harvest of sin will both come to fullness at the end of the age. The harvest of righteousness and the harvest of sin are both going to come to fullness. That the seeds of righteousness have been sown for 2,000 years and there's going to be a harvest. It's called the wheat. But the seeds of sin have been sown for 2,000 years and they're coming to a harvest as well. Jesus said, Matthew 13, verse 30, let both the wheat, that's the seeds of the good seeds, and the tares, that's the bad seeds, let them both mature together, is what he was saying. And at the end of the age, they will mature together. And there's many scriptures that verify that sin will reach its highest heights, but righteousness and the glory of God in the church will reach its highest heights too. And they will, this will happen simultaneously. One of the key passages on this would be Isaiah 60 verse 1 that I don't have here, where it says that when darkness, deep darkness covers the earth, the glory of the Lord will break out. When the deep darkness of man's depravity And the great tribulation is breaking forth at the very same time the glory of the Lord is shining through His people. Joel chapter 2, verse 11, tells us that the day of the Lord, that means the events related to the second coming of Jesus. The day of the Lord means a little more than that, but that's the heart of it. It will be great, meaning very positive, And it will be very terrible. There it will be the greatest revival, the great day, but it will be the very terrible day. Now, most, I mean, not necessarily most, most people are vague on it. They don't even have an opinion. And that really is going to change in the years to come. Because just the pressure of the Holy Spirit pressure, I mean that in the positive sense, with greater revelation to go forth in power. And then the pressure of darkness to resist the power, that intensity is going to increase in the positive and the negative. So we really do need answers that can steady us and that we can give to those who challenge the position that we have. But here it is. One camp focuses on the great, the breakthrough, the power. They put their energy on the breakthrough is coming. Not on the resistance, but the other group puts their energy on the resistance and not the breakthrough. Again, which is it? Is it breakthrough or is it resistance with pressure? And the answer is it's breakthrough in the midst of resistance with pressure. And 
we will have a deep personal involvement in what happens in our geographic part of the earth. Meaning, when the glory of God goes forth like the waters cover the sea. Now, how do the waters cover the sea? Well, one place, the water's five inches deep. The other place, the water's five miles deep. In one place, the water in the ocean is still. In another place, there's a tsunami breaking forth in the same ocean. If you consider all the oceans of the world, it's one big body of water. One place, the water's hot or warm. The other place, it's freezing. Well, the glory of God is going to break forth like the waters cover the sea. There will be different depths, different intensities. There will be different resistance that just like the waters of the sea. If somebody got up and asked you, on a global level, how's the water doing in the sea right now? You'd say, well, where? You'd say, no, no, just give me a general kind of report, how the waters are all doing tonight. You'd say, well, there is no one answer. You mean the warm or the cold, the tsunami or the still water in the bay? What are you talking about? They'd say, no, I just want one answer. And the obvious answer would be, there is not one answer. There will be a diversity of glory and a diversity of darkness, and it will be different in every single region of the world, and it will be in the hands and in the balance of how the people of God respond to God. That's why it matters that we believe the positive is coming, because we want to go forth in faith for breakthrough and power. But we don't want to be idealistic about it, because then we will get confused and offended when the resistance is stronger than we've imagined because it will be stronger than any time in history. I know what I'm believing for my geographic area. And I'm believing different things for other places. But it will be different all over America. It's not going to be one evenly distributed measure of glory or darkness in our nation or in the nations of the earth. It will be different measures and intensity of light and darkness everywhere in the earth. And it will be in the hands of the people of God how they respond in agreement to God. If they respond in wholeheartedness and in faith and in diligently going forward without looking back, more will happen. If they retreat in fear and in confusion, then less good will happen. Someone says, well, it's whatever the Lord wants. And the Lord says, I want To respond to the measure of your agreement with me. That's what I want. Well, no, Lord. Just whatever you want. Okay? I want to respond to the measure my people in every area of the earth agree with me. We put it on the Lord. He pulls us back into the relationship as well. Now, it's not all on us, but he's not letting us out of the dynamics of it. So it really matters that we get what's going on. Because as we approach the coming of the Lord, and it's my personal opinion that there's people alive on the earth today that will see it with their eyes. Maybe my grandchildren. Maybe their children even. I don't know. But I believe we are approaching that time in history where the intensity of the darkness and the glory on a global level is obviously increasing unto the coming of the Lord. Paragraph H. There are many unique dynamics that will occur in the generation the Lord returns. Meaning unique dynamics of positive and negative that have never coexisted together in one generation history ever before. The positive will surpass the book of Acts. The negative will surpass any time in history. And those two dimensions in their intensity will exist in the same generation on a global level. That is unique. There will be nothing like it. These unique dynamics are such 
That the body of Christ must be prepared in understanding and they must be prepared in faith in order to overcome in that hour. It's not an issue where we just kind of say, well, it'll take care of itself. No. No, it's there are unique dynamics of positive and negative that will come together in an intensity that has never happened in any generation ever. A totally unique hour of history. And the biggest issue will be the issue of understanding. Because the people that understand, they will have confidence. They will grow in love. They will have diligence. They will press forward boldly. The people who don't understand, they will be confused. They will be offended at God or tempted to be. They will be tricked and deceived by the ploys of darkness. They will be in confusion and most of them will draw back and just kind of hunker down and hope the storm passes and many of them will be devoured in the storm. It really matters that we understand the broad strokes of the positive and the negatives. Again, not all the fine details, but the broad strokes. He has a plan, paragraph H, Jesus does, to intervene in the affairs of the nations in such a unique way. In a way he's never done at this level of intensity. He is going to to transition the earth to the age to come in one generation. Can you imagine that? There's one generation of which the planet is going to be transitioned to the age to come. And the people alive in that generation will be deeply participating with Jesus in that plan. And in that same generation, let's look at this, paragraph H, he will drive evil off the planet forever in that generation. There's no time like this in history. But he's not going to do it in a vacuum. Meaning, he's not just going to wave his hand and do it. He's going to do it with us and through us. He's going to do it in partnership with his people. And the people must agree and understand with what he's doing in the broad sense. He's going to release his glory. But he's also going to release his judgments. Now his judgments, look at this at the end of paragraph H. The point of his judgments are to remove everything that hinders love. His judgments will remove everything that hinders love. That's the point of them. Some people say, how could a God of love judge? And it's opposite. The question is opposite. How could a God of love not judge? I talked to one man. Why I've used this analogy many times, so I've, I, this has been a number of conversations. Who is really against the judgments of God? As though the judgments of God are a contradiction to who Jesus is. Instead of an expression of his love and wisdom and glory. I said, so, a group of evil men come to the park one day and your family's there enjoying some time together. And they begin to uh, take hold of your wife and children and abuse them in the most severe way. The policeman walks by and he goes, you know, I don't want to be negative. I just want to, you know, give people space. I'm a real positive policeman. And I tolerate in my mercy. And they're destroying your family in the most hideous way you could imagine. So now you meet the policeman. Do you think he's wise and loving? Or do you think he's really missing a couple things? He said, well, obviously that would be bad. I go, that's the point. Corruption and oppression is going to reach a level on the earth beyond any time in human history. And for Jesus to allow it to go without intervening, he then could be accused of not being a God of love. But he's going to intervene like no time in history. Yes, manifesting his glory on one hand, in terms of the positive sense of the miracles of salvation, but also manifesting his glory on the other hand, which is he's removing the things that hinder love. The great tribulation, the end of paragraph H, Jesus will will use the least severe means to reach... The greatest number of people at the deepest level of love. He is figured into 
His plan, the free will of man to choose evil in a steadfast way. And he won't violate the free will of man. He says, I have a plan that I have figured in with my perfect foreknowledge the free will of men to resist in a steadfast way the goodness of God and to afflict people. And he says, I will use the least severe means, the least, to reach the most in the deepest level of love without violating anyone's free will. That's the great tribulation. Top of page two. Now again, we're not going to cover all this, but just to give you some Material, again, don't be tripped up by five or ten terms. You can learn them in five minutes. You really can't. Get with a few friends if they're new to you and just kind of quiz each other. But these are the terms that many in the body of Christ worldwide are using these same terms. These are terms that are widely used by people from all different streams. Now, I like to call it apostolic Christianity. Sometimes I call our position historic premillennialism with the victorious church. I like to say it shorter. I call it apostolic premillennialism. Meaning, it's the historic premillennial position, but with the apostolic church. And the apostolic church meaning the church full of glory. Like the New Testament church. That's what I mean. So that's paragraph A and B. Let's go down to Roman numeral 3. What is apostolic Christianity? What is New Testament Christianity? I use the term apostolic and and, and New Testament almost interchangeably. The kind of church that's going to emerge, it will be Jesus-centered. The church that will emerge in victory, in the hour he comes, will have such an allegiance to him, they will proclaim his supremacy, his glory, his worth. They They will give their allegiance to Jesus like no time in history. I mean like the early church, but the numbers will just be larger. A billion worldwide will have such allegiance. It will be church-centered. Jesus is building his church and he's coming back for it. It will be wholehearted. It will walk in holiness. D, it will operate in supernatural power. E, it will grow from a foundation of prayer with intimacy with God. F, It will have a missionary spirit as it embraces the Great Commission and the cultural mandate, which is the same thing. G, it will embrace persecution without backing down. That's part of the warfare. It will engage with God's purpose for Israel. And I, it will be free from the wrath of God. And what I mean by that, the church going through the tribulation... The wrath of God isn't on the church. The tribulation is the wrath of God on the Antichrist. When Moses went into Egypt, the judgment didn't come on Moses. The judgment came on Pharaoh. Well, the deliverance of the children of Israel from Pharaoh was a snapshot. It was a foreshadowing of the end time drama. There will be an end-time Pharaoh called the Antichrist. There will be an end-time Moses called the praying church. And the praying church will stretch forth their rod, and the judgments of God will come against Pharaoh, not against the people of God. I've heard people say, well, we go to the tribulation, it'll be terrible. I go, are you kidding? Moses went through this situation He didn't say, well, Lord, I don't want to release the judgment of God and the Antichrist. I just want to be raptured. It was the greatest hour of Israel's history. So the the judgment's not on the church. The judgment is on the oppressors. And it's actually released by Jesus and, and in partnership, particularly in the final three and a half years, even in partnership with the praying church. Top of page three. Roman numeral four, the millennial kingdom. What is it? Most of you know, most of you know, it's a literal thousand year period that Jesus will rule on the earth in righteousness. 
That's paragraph A and B. You can read that on your own. Most of you are aware of it. It's a literal period of time where Jesus literally rules the earth in person from Jerusalem for 1,000 years. Okay, let's go to middle page three. Middle page three. Roman numeral six. Three common views of the millennium. There's three major views of this thousand year reign. And anyone that has a view, 99% they have one of these three views. And these are the three terms you need to use. Again, many people, they don't think about it, so they don't have a view. That's not a good position. So, I don't know. It'll take care of itself. It, it won't. It's like, I like what Alan Hood says. You know, one guy says, well, it will all pan out. And Alan says, I'm sure it will, but will it pan out well for you? Because your response to the Lord will have a dynamic relationship to what happens in your sphere. Roman numeral six. The three different views of the millennial kingdom, actually. It's what we're talking about here. Premillennial, which I believe is the biblical view. Jesus returns pre or before the thousand years. We believe he returns after a time of glory and crisis through the great tribulation. He returns, and then after he returns is the thousand-year reign. Of course, he's sitting on his throne in Jerusalem. But he returns before it. That's why they call it pre. He, he returns before the thousand years. And I believe uh, boldly that is the biblical view. Another camp... They're called post-millennial. And there's not so many in this camp today. In the 1800s, there were a lot more. Not so many. The post-millennial view, and there's several versions of it. Jesus comes post or after the thousand years. Now, th this is, to me, it it's so hard for me to think that people really believe this. But they do. That we're in the millennium now. And Jesus comes after the millennium is over. After we've Christianized the world. Then he comes. A lot of smart guys believe that. They really do. And a whole lot believe that in the 1800s. But after two great world wars, this view went, lot. Of, they said no more. But it's kind of re, uh, having a, resur or, uh, a resurgence. The numbers are small. But there's a growing number of theologians that are saying that. And the thing that's fueling some of them is this urgency of the Spirit and the anointing of God for us to disciple the nations to bring the kingdom to every sphere of society. But you can have that conviction and believe in that anointing and feel that weight of the spirit without believing we're in the millennium now and it's only going to get better and better but there's a growing camp that think we're in the millennium and the second coming's after the millennium's over then c is the most common camp among among theologians it's all millennialism i mean in the last uh, few decades and it means A, or A, means no. There is no millennium. It's not Jesus doesn't come after it or before it. There isn't one. It's all figurative. It's all symbolic. Now that's the easiest approach. Because the 150 chapters in the Bible, yes, you heard me right, 150 chapters in the Bible, we have them on our website, that... The primary subject is the end times. They don't have to work through any of them. Because it's all symbolic. It's all like a big poem. It's God's poem that he gives. Kind of describing the spiritual dynamics in a figurative way of the conflict we're going through. And the amillennial, they believe it all speaks of all this, these verses in the Bible. They speak of Really just conquering sin in the heart. It's an internal victory. It's not an external victory. That's the easiest one because you don't have to work through any of the verses. 
But it's surprising to me that a lot of the intellectuals, they choose this one. And some of the intellectuals I've talked to, they said, it's just so ridiculous to really believe Jesus is coming back and all the nations, oh, come on, let's be real. And I go, we're talking about Jesus, the Genesis 1 Jesus. It's easy for him to do this. So some of them just believe it's just ridiculous to believe the literal events of what end time prophecy talks about because they're too extreme. And, and that's not a good reason to back away from it because it seems extreme. I told one guy, it is extreme. It's more extreme than we can imagine. Top of page four. Well, the amillennial view of the kingdom, the strength of it, the strength of it, A, spiritual victory over sin in the heart. That's the strength. I like that. When a guy says, I am an amillennial, theologian, at least you know they believe in victory over sin in the heart. I go, good. I, I like that point. That's good. I'm taking that from you. The weakness. Most, not all, most of the end time prophecy, I get 150 chapters in the Bible. Most of it is figurative, symbolic. It doesn't mean what it says. Ouch. That leaves me empty. 150 chapters. Now, that's a lot of Bible. And they embrace replacement theology, which means that the church has replaced Israel, so everything God has promised Israel, they say the church gets it. That's why it's called replacement. The church replaces Israel. Except for it's inconsistent because the all millennial theologians, they go, the church replaces the Israel, but they only give the church the promises. They don't give the church any of the negative stuff. I go, come on. We can't be selective and take the positive and make it literal. And then, I mean, symbolic, of course, to the church, and then take the negative and dismiss it. Either if it's all given to us, then the bad stuff is given to us too. They go, no, no, we don't want the bad stuff. We just want the good stuff. So it seems a, a bit inconsistent to me. Let's learn, look at the middle of page four. Roman numeral eight. Let's go to post-millennial. And, I, and again, we're not going to look at all the details. What's the strength of post-millennial? The cultural mandate, which is another term for the Great Commission. It's that we are to impact the culture, every sphere of society. We are to bring the kingdom to every sphere of society in an increasing impact. And the Spirit is really breathing on that truth in this last couple decades. We want to bring the kingdom to every sphere of society. Now, we won't Christianize all society. But we will make significant inroads. Some guy goes, how far will we go? I said, well, it's like the glory of God is like the water covers the sea. In one region, they will reach far greater heights of affecting the different areas of society. And in another region, they won't reach near so far. The balance is open. But we won't Christianize. We will not bring every sphere of society under the leadership of Jesus in a complete way before he comes. But we're going to make significant advancements. Someone goes, how significant is significant? And the answer is, every geographic region of the world, it will be different. Like the water covers the sea, so the glory of God in the earth. There is no way of knowing, but I know that the area that I have responsibility in, that God has placed me, I'm contending for a double portion, and then when the Lord gives it, another double portion, and we'll just keep doubling it and see how far it goes until the Lord returns. We don't have to know. How far, far is. All we know is whatever measure we have, we're going for more. But we also know there will be an increased intensity of pressure against it. We won't cower before the pressure, but neither will we minimize it and pretend it doesn't exist. Because if the people don't know it, they will be offended and tripped. And they will lose heart in the battle if they don't know there's a battle at this level of intensity. Now everyone knows there's a battle. But I tell you. There is an intensity coming beyond any time of history. The positive and the negative. Well, the weakness of this view, paragraph B, is very similar to the amillennial. 
Prophecy is symbolic. They don't take it at face value. And what I mean by we take it literal, I don't mean a wooden literal, you know, some kind of forced literal view that isn't really, isn't really what God meant. I mean a face value literal view. God means what he says and said what he means in a plain sense meaning is what prophecy means. And I found that in the amillennial, postmillennial view, I have found significant inconsistencies in their hermeneutics or their principle of interpretation. Hermeneutics, most of you know, is just a fancy word for interpretation. The principles of interpretation. What I find in the hermeneutics or the way that theologians interpret the Bible, the end time passages, they take positive promises literal, but they take the details in that same context, they take it figurative. You can't take verse 2 literal and verse 3 figurative. Then verse 4 is figurative or symbolic. Verse 5 is a good one. We'll make that one literal. We can't approach the scripture with that kind of inconsistency. That's a superficial approach. We have to, verse 2, 3, and 4, they're either literal or they are symbolic. And we have to, we can't get rid of the hard passages when they don't fit our, our vision. We have to interpret the passages literally in their plain meaning. I, I personally, I don't mean this in a dishonoring way, but I've talked to different theologians, post millennial, all millennial, and when I point out this thousands of verses, I mean, there are multitudes of verses, I don't know the number, but multitudes. They go, well, we don't really know. Nobody really knows what that means. I go, come on. It means what it says. Well, no, because it meant what it said, then that means there'd be a literal millennium. And, I, and I've said this, I want to do it kindly, but it seems a little dishonest to me to take the positive things literal and the things that don't fit your scheme, make them symbolic or just ignore them. We need an approach to the scripture. If there's 10 verses, we approach the whole 10 verses the same way. We honor the word of God. Okay, let's look at top of page five. Now, the premillennial view. Jesus is coming pre before the millennium. That's what I believe the scripture teaches. The strength of this view is that they take the scriptures, the prophetic scriptures, literally at face value. I love that. And they seek to honor God's purpose for the nation of Israel. Now, most people in this room right here I suspect, are premillennial. The kind of people that take the Bible face value serious and they want to walk with it, many of them, not all of them, but many of them are premillennial. I'm talking about when they take the prophetic scripture that way. Now there's two different, this is important because this is, could, will matter to you. There's two different types or two different views or approaches of premillennial. Premillennialism. There's the historic premillennialism, which I believe is the biblical one, if you throw the victorious church in it. And there's the dispensational premillennial. And they're quite different. They have a number of similarities, but there's a point or two that's really, really different. So when I tell somebody I'm premillennial, that's not enough. They'll look at me. If you tell somebody, they say, well, what's your end time view? I'm premillennial. 99% of the time, they will assume you are dispensational premillennial. And the dispensational premillennial, they think the rapture's coming any minute. And the negative of that, besides the fact that I don't believe that's a biblical concept, that he's coming any minute, he's coming at the end of a series of events that he prophesied. But put that aside for now. The negative side of that, if he's coming any minute, why do we have to bother bringing the gospel to society? Because the Antichrist is going to win society anyway. So let's just, let's lead people to the Lord and let the nations just live in darkness. That's a huge concession. That's a huge abdicating of our responsibility because we were called and anointed to disciple nations. 
to influence society, not just to lead souls to the Lord. To do them both. We don't pick between them. B, historic premillennialism, which I believe is the biblical view. They believe the rapture is after the tribulation, after we've walked in the glory and victory, like no time in history. The dispensational premillennial, this is the big point, they think the rapture is before the tribulation, that we escape it, and that just society just falls into utter darkness. I give some more on dispensationalism there. You can read it on your own. Paragraph Roman numeral 10. Now I give a few positives on dispensational premillennialism, but several negatives. I believe this is a wrong approach. And I have it laid out there. Why? And again, many people would agree with these definitions. They would have a different opinion as to which is the right one and the wrong one. But the basic definitions are are not hard to uh, uh, lay out. This is a general overview. There's always exceptions. This is a general overview of the negatives of dispensational premillennialism. Now that sounds like a big word, but most of you know it. It's really not a big word. Say it. Say dispensational premillennialism. Say it. You got it. See, you already got one down. Say postmillennialism, amillennialism, premillennialism, dispensational premillennialism, and historic premillennialism. Go ahead. No, say them. You got them all. Now say hermeneutic. That was my other big word. You got the whole thing. You're already, you're pros. You're, you're scholars. Top of page six. Coming to an end. Historic premillennialism. The traditional view. I mean the one for 2,000 years. And it's been the primary view over church history, by the way. The dispensational premillennialism actually began in 1830s. It actually began in the 1830s. It's only, it's not even a 200 year old system. It is not a system that is 2,000 years old. I have those kind of uh, details in the notes so you can read that on your own. Well, the strength of this view. A, the literal interpretation of prophecy. That's good. Preparing for persecution so we're not offended when it happens. That's good. Responsibility with Israel. The weakness of the traditional historic view, they don't emphasize the great harvest. They go, well, the church is going to get holier but smaller. I mean, the ones that make it will be awesome, but the numbers will shrink and shrink and shrink. I believe we're going to see a great harvest, an outpouring of the Spirit and power, and we're going to function in the bridal paradigm with intimacy with God. And the historic view traditionally doesn't have those three components of the victorious church. Roman numeral 12, which I believe is the right view. The historic premillennialism and the victorious church. Paragraph A, the view that I'm putting forth combines the strength of postmillennialism. In other words, we engage in the culture now to bring the kingdom to society and with great boldness. We accept the strength of amillennialism, the spiritual victory in the, in the heart over sin and Satan. We take the strengths of historic premillennialism, which is the literal interpretation of Scripture the enduring through persecution, and the provoking of the nation of Israel. But we add to it the full participation of the praying bride at the end, who is in intimacy with God, with the first commandment, used by God to bring the great harvest in. Paragraph B. It's a victorious church. 
that will be used now, not just then. Because we're used now because we're making a real difference now. But even part of the being used now and making a real difference is part of our training to be used more later. So we don't wait till some day in the future to be used. We don't huddle up in a room and pray and then one day, many years from now, we're used. No, we're used now with, with full diligence and the very impact we're making now is actually that God using us, is training us as a church. I'm talking about worldwide for something far greater. Paragraph C, this view, it's not just that we don't yield to persecution. We will walk in holiness. And the first commandment restored to first place in the Sermon on the Mount lifestyle. And I'll end here with paragraph D. It's a relevant church. Meaning, what we're doing today. Some people in the post-millennial view, they think, well, if the devil's going to win anyway in society, I go, no, we're not the, we don't have the dispensational view. The devil's not going to just triumph in darkness everywhere. Light is breaking forth too. We're not giving in and abdicating society to the devil. We're not. Even more than that, I believe when we understand what the Bible teaches about the millennial kingdom, the gains and the victories that we make now in this age, now listen carefully, some of them will have continuity and they will still be in place in the age to come. If we remove abortion from this city and state, and when the Lord returns, abortion has been driven out, of this state, when he comes, that is a law that will not have to be overturned. That law will stay in place. If there are just economic policies and just laws, when the Lord comes and shakes everything that can be shaken, there are many things that will be built on righteousness that won't be shaken. They will remain, meaning our labors matter because there's continuity with them even to the age to come. Well, this was a kind of a heady message. But for those called to the marketplace and the emphasis of the Spirit in these last years to get the people out into the different spheres of society, discipling the nations, bringing the kingdom and power outside the walls of the four church, we need to know what the Bible says. We don't buy into the overly... Pessimistic, we don't buy the exaggerated, overly optimistic, but we buy into the biblical, realistic view. Great victory, great resistance, overcoming in power, enduring steadfastly by the anointing. And our works matter, and some of them will even have continuity to the age to come. Amen and amen. Let's stand.